here we get the the the, the uh, notice here, right? The three the three words here. This this portion in the middle portion, the top portion, and then within that is a a, a, a smaller portion there. And so what I was suggesting was that uh, if you uh, look at this image, which is a uh, universally accepted, so the three lokas uh, represent the the upper portion, which is what you might, if you want to use the Christian term, heaven, uh, the Siddha Lok, uh, um, the, the Madhya Lok uh, is the middle portion there, which is the terrestrial or material world, and then the lower portion represents the, the underworld or, or hell, all right? Uh, and the swastika, which is the part that you didn't hear, so you got, if you look at this over here, there are four arms, correct? One, two, three, four. Uh, and they have multiple meanings, actually. So the four arms represent the fourfold community. And, and this community is in hierarchical order. It's in hierarchical order, right? Uh, the monks or the male renouncers, that is, the munis or sadhus. Then you get the nuns, the female renouncers, the sadhvis. Uh, and then you get uh, lay men and lay women. Right? That's the fourfold community. It also represents what are called the four characteristics of uh, the soul uh, and the four states of existence, which is, which is the devas, the humans, asuras, asuras are the demons, and then the subhuman, which is flora and fauna. Okay? So it's it's a complete representation, and then and then what you see at the at the bottom of that uh, is this aphorism, uh, which translates into all life is bound together by mutual support and independence, and this is what I'm referring to over here. Okay. So this is the this is the the sim symbolism that represents uh, Jain uh, the Jain worldview um, includes includes. Uh, some of the principal precepts, the idea of nonviolence, uh, the idea of the fourfold community, uh, the notion of the Ratna Triya, right? the right faith, right conduct, right knowledge, the idea of the Siddha Lok, those who have now achieved a level of transcendence, um, etc. It's a, it's a, the symbol it seeks to encompass, you know, a great deal. All that is really critical in some ways. Of course, you don't get the five. Uh, the five vows, for example, uh, but then, but but if you're looking at you know uh, sort of one symbol that encompasses a substantial portion of the Jain worldview, this is this is that symbol. The spokes, of course, uh, you you know the twenty-four tantras because there are twenty-four of them and samsara, the wheel of re birth and rebirth. You know, right? So you know it 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 looks uh, almost like a human. In other, in, other, in other words, look at it this way. Compare it to this. You see, it's, it's, it's an anthrop, this is an anthropomorphic conception of the Jain universe. That is a Jain concept universe, which, has, which is in the shape of a human. Yeah, inserted into the body of a human. And, and this image was undoubtedly inspired, I would say, by many such images of that kind, which are actually maps. That image I took is from a from a from a, a history of cartography, uh, a very authoritative history of cartography, which also looks at these kinds of maps. Because we have to change our conception of what a map is. You know, a map is not just the kind of map that we know it is, but there are different ways of mapping. And this, and you map the body. So this, and the body then maps the body politic. That is the world outside. So. In that sense, this is actually the originary map is something like this, where the body maps the body politic, body politic meaning the world outside. Right? And mm -hmm. this image here, you can see the relationship. It's, as I said, almost in the figure of a human. But that would be my, that would be my speculation. They, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I'm not present at the discussions that took place 40, 
45 years ago that led to the acceptance of this symbolism and perhaps there is some archival record of how they they arrived at it but this is what it is uh, i've spoken about the renouncers uh, their traditions um, let's spend a little bit more time on them we'll, and then we'll move quickly to the conclusion. So they are itinerant, they move around from one place to another, interacting with lay people wherever they went. There's a very interesting question um, and that question uh, uh, I have sort of hinted at on previous lectures, a couple of them, uh, and that has to do with, you will recall I had mentioned that Buddhism disappeared from India. Right? You remember that, right? It disappeared mm. from the land of its birth. Now, Jainism didn't. And, and this has long been a question. How, did, how is it that Jainism survived and Buddhism didn't in India? Because in India, it really vanished. And there are eight or ten reasons. Uh, the Jain scholars focus on just a few. Uh, the, the Buddhist scholars tend to focus on for example, many of them focus on the coming of Islam. Ambedkar mentioned the coming of Islam uh, and, and it death, uh, del, uh, death uh, uh, you know, delivered a, the death blow uh, to, uh, to Buddhism, which was already on the decline. By the fifth, sixth century, it was on the decline. A, a Chinese traveler who comes to India notices that the monasteries are you know, beginning to decline a bit, all right? Um, and, and we'll notice that the nuns, the Buddhist nuns are going to disappear first because people tended to give more money to the monks than they did to, to nuns. But even, even the monks, Buddhist monks start disappearing. And then by the 12th, 13th century, Buddhism is pretty much gone. Now, that didn't happen to Jainism. Why didn't it happen? So one, so among other reasons, um, you could say that their small number saved them because if they had been present in much larger numbers, it's counterintuitive, right? You would think that if they were larger in number, they would be, it would be harder to eliminate them. But no, because they were much smaller in number, maybe they were not seen as a threat by Muslims, right? But that places too much emphasis on the coming of Islam and on the Muslim invader. I think the more persuasive reasons is because the Jain renouncing, renouncer tradition was very strong. See, the Jain monk and the nuns too. When I'm now here, when I use monk, I'm using it as a shorthand for all renouncers, male and female. They, if you go back to Mahavir's renunciation, you see their tradition was they move from one place to another. All right, they move from one place to another. Now, this also meant that unlike the Buddhist monasteries, which received large donations, and when you receive large donations, what do you do? You build a large monastery, then people start staying there. And when they stay there, then they're likely to gather possessions. And they're likely to become lazy. And they may become corrupt. It, it, it feeds. These are cycles. You know, it's, it's like the rich you would think that, well, they're rich, so they don't need any more. No, but they want more. That's been proven any number of times. I mean, I, I love all these MBA types who, who tell me that all studies have shown that you need only $75,000 is like the ideal. After that, you, you're not any happier than you are if you have $75,000 a year, you can be happy, all right? Well, well, then if you have a million, then why do you want to make 10 million more? And if you have 10 million, why do you want to make another 50 million more? And if you have a billion, why do you want to make 50 billion? It, that's, that's how it goes. So the, the, the Jain monks, you see, they never stayed in one place. They had to constantly move. The Mahavir's renunciation was the model. They, I, this meant also that they had a closer contact with laity with lay people. See, the Buddhist monks ceased to have a con contacts with lay people to the degree. So there was a very sharp bifurcation. And, and it meant that if you killed off the monks, you basically destroyed the religion. In the Jain religion, the, the monks ironically had greater contact. Why? Because they went from door to door and they were also told, the texts say that very clearly, don't take too much from one house. Partly because you don't want to put too much burden on one house to give food. But also because 
If you go to six different houses or 10 different houses, you get to have more interaction with more lay people. And then there, and, and some of these interactions meant you could preach and teach more lay people. Right? This, this is the most interesting thing probably, if you're looking at the social history of Jainism. This itinerancy, the begging for food, okay, the injunction not to possess, all of this was critically important. And this is what I've described in this, what I've summarized for you is all summarized uh, in this slide over here. Small gifts of food, and the monks are not sedentary. So, you know, they, they would very often re refuse large scale gifts because what would, would they do with a large scale gift? If you were not going to be sedentary, you're not gonna be staying in one place, you're moving around constantly. You know, and so you don't find you don't find th that these monastic these renouncers actually living in these kind of large monasteries that Buddhist monks began to live in. And you can still see these very large Buddhist monasteries all over the Buddhist world in Southeast Asia as well. You go to Thailand and they're it's chock full of them, chock full of them. Right. So this is that question: the survival of Jainism, disappearance of Buddhism. I could say a lot more about this because there were other reasons too, but I think it's enough to uh, get you to sort of think about this very interesting phenomenon. Um, uh, you know, and as I said, some of the explanations are, are I think less convincing. Some focus a little too much on their small numbers, uh, and which meant that the Jains were relatively invisible uh, compared to the Buddhists. Um, but it really has to do, I want to insist on that, it really has to do with the role of ascetics. In Jainism is quite different than the role of ascetics in that sense uh, in Buddhism, because it also meant that the monks were venerated a lot more in Jainism than they are in Buddhism. Uh, they were venerated more because in, in Buddhism, and you see that again now, in modern day Buddhism, when you go to a monastery, you'll see lots of young boys, hundreds, thousands of young boys in Thailand, for example, and you, that you in Jain, the monk is the renouncer, and that these are people who have, who over many years have cultivated austerities. All right, uh, they're much more mature in that sense too, age-wise as well, uh, and they correspondingly receive greater veneration because they're seen as living embodiments, not of those who have attained perfect enlightenment yet but as of those who represent the Jain quest for moksha, that these are the ideal representation, representatives of those who represent this quest for moksha or renunciation. You know, right? That's a difference. And, and this is here, this is the fourfold community that I'm speaking about. Um, and I just want to explain this over here. So, I mean, I've given the them in hierarchical order. So you begin with the top and move down to the bottom uh, to the lay women, the monks followed by nuns and laymen. And I've given the terms that you would use uh, in, in uh, uh, an Indian language, uh, such as modern day Hindi, uh, Gujarati would have similar terms, shravakas for the laymen and shravikas for the lay women. Uh, but this, what I want to explain here is that you, you find out more about the nuns and lay women in stories. Uh, the monks you find out in, in stories as well. And Jaina literature is full of stories. Hundreds, thousands of stories. These stories are meant to be object lessons about renunciation. Some of them are extremely convoluted. And, and I'm going to end today's presentation in a few minutes with one story, all right? Uh, but, but for the male renouncers, the, the, the theological texts, uh, which I've mentioned, the, such as the Kalpa Sutra, for example, you know, for example, although that's mainly biographies, those kinds of texts uh, are texts that tell us a lot about the monks and the male uh, laity, you know, all right? For the women, you tend to find out more about them only through the stories. Um, women are very important to the tradition. Um, and 
the religion may be patriarchal as some have argued, but whether it's patriarchal or not, or whether it's as patriarchal as other religions, what is important to remember is that depending on the scholar and depending on how they've looked at it, all scholars agree that there are at least twice as many nuns as monks. So there are more female renouncers than male renouncers. Some say the ratio is five to one. Um, I, I'm not in a position to be able to say whether that's right or wrong, but some scholars say it's five to one um, and others say it's two to one, but all scholars agree. All observers of the religion agree there, there are at least twice as many nuns as, um, as monks. Um, the stories also dwell on the similarities of all of these four. Um, communities, the fourfold community, the theological texts tend to actually emphasize the differences between the renouncers, both male and female on the one hand, and, and the lay people, all right? And then we get to the five vows of the Jain monk, the Mahavrats. Uh, so Ahimsa, which we've spoken about, Satya, uh, truth, uh, uh, a non-stealing, to take nothing that is not properly given, right? Uh, and sometimes something could fall under both. Let's take an illustration. You go to the market and you know that even today, the vegetable sellers, uh, if you're going to a small market where they're not using a digital scale, they use the old scale, right? Where they where they uh, uh, where you put you know the vegetables uh, or fruit whatever it is on one side of the scale and then you put the weight on the other and sometimes they use weights that are not correct all right now that is both a form of untruth if they're deceiving you but it's also a form of asetya because why because that person is actually taking from you in a sense what belongs to you, right? If he's, if he's weighing it as half a kilo, but it's really only 450 grams, he has actually taken 50 grams there, which is not his. It has not been given to him, right? So it's not that these categories are always so transparent. You know, you, uh, we, we would, something may fall under more than one category, obviously. Uh, but, but these are the Mahavrats, the, the Maha as in Mahabharat, Mahatma, great Vrats, non-negotiable. The fourth one is Brahmacharya, celibacy, literally celibacy, renunciation of sensual pleasures, but it means getting closer to God, right? They were very important, all of these five for Gandhi. <coughs> uh, Aparigraha, non-attachment, non-possession. We had a little discussion over this when we were looking at this, at the schism between the Swetambaras and the Digambaras. Um, the Digambara renouncer, the one who goes around naked, uh, is actually only an, allowed to carry only two objects. Remember, can't have the monk can, the male renouncer cannot have any clothes on him. None whatsoever. All right. Uh, and those two objects are this pichi, the which is a pe peacock feather whisk broom, where that is that he gently sweeps the the street the pavement before he puts his foot on it so he has to keep on sweeping as he's walking to ensure that he's swept aside gently ants or other living creatures that he might otherwise tread on and he must go barefooted of course uh, uh, and then the other object is the uh kamandalu which is the wooden water pot which is also the bowl in which he receives the food uh, the Shwetambra renouncer is allowed to carry up to 14 objects, so it would be those two and several others, including the loincloth, because the Shwetambra renouncer doesn't go around completely naked, uh, and the shoulder cloth. Um, uh, the, so for the monk, you have the five great Mahavrats. You also have what are called the five self-regulations. This is the regimen of the monk. This describes in totality this here. The, the five Mahavrats, the five Samitis, the three Guptis uh, re, re, describes the complete regimen of the monk. It must exercise carefulness in addition to the five great Vrats, carefulness in refraining from harming any living being. 
while walking, speaking, accepting arms, moving things around and disposing of food or bodily waste products. Uh, this can get, you know, because you might say that, well, isn't this really included in, in, in ahimsa? Well, it's an elaboration, you could say, right? The carefulness, the ahimsa is nonviolence. Uh, it's certainly not included in asetya, taking, you know, theft, right? Taking what is not properly yours. Um, so that's why they added this on to indicate the life of complete renunciation and what it entails. And then the three restraints, restraint and the use of speech, thought um, and action. That is verbal restraint, mental restraint and restraint in physical activity. And then for the lay person, you have 12 vows, those who have not embraced renunciation, those who are still householders, for example, or even if, they're, even if they have become aged but have not uh, embraced renunciation, which would be the vast majority, right, of, of Jains, would be lay people. Uh, the five great vrats in a more limited form, because in the more extreme form, such as aparigra for in the extreme form of the gamra means two, two, two objects. So for the lay person, you take the five great vrats, but in a more limited form, they are called anuvrats. Vrat is, vrat is a word for a, a vow, right? Uh, and then the three merit vrats and the five siksha or discipline vrats. Uh, we don't need to go over all of that because it'll get, take too much time to go into each of these. But essentially the idea is you take ideas and you, uh, so if, for example, if you're undertaking activity, well, you limit it, limit it. Don't, don't engage in purposeless activity. You know, don't engage in purposeless travel. Don't engage uh, in um, uh, things that require, or that could put you, not put you at risk, but put your dedication to the elimination of karmic material at risk. That's really the way to look at it, right? Because if you're in this world, then you have to partake of it. You have to partake of it. So you're a businessman, you use a cell phone, but then you learn how to limit the use of the cell phone. Right? And the Choda Niyam, which you can look at at your leisure. I mean, this is to give you how detailed some of the texts will become. Limit the number of vehicles used to two a day. Limit the number of fragrances to 15 a day. That sounds very excessive to me. So, you know, you'd have to, <laughs> you'd have to really look at the text to see what exactly they mean by that in great detail. You know, all right? That's, that, that, that's what the Choda 14 Niyam's rules, observances. And finally, we come to the two um, things we haven't looked at. One is we haven't actually looked at a story and we haven't looked at what I think was, in addition to Ahimsa, the most important thing that Gandhi took away from Jainism and what I think is the great contribution of Jain philosophy uh, to world uh, thinking, all right? Uh, we begin with this, Syadvad. Vad is a, uh, um, suffix, a word which can be added to many such words and, and means uh, worldview or view. All right. So, um, in, for example, this doctrine of make ananta vad, vad is use the same ending here, view or theory, right? That's what it means. Uh, sometimes it's used to refer to schools, as in schools of thought. So there is a giant doctrine called Syadvad. Uh, this we have to understand before we move to really what is, I think, the principal contribution uh, of Jain philosophy, which is Anek Anantavad. Right? But Syadvad is the doctrine of conditioned viewpoints from the word Sanskrit Syad. Syad and Conditioned viewpoint means the doctrine that all judgments are conditional. Viable only in certain conditions or circumstances. Sadvad is also known as Sapta Bhangi, that is the seven. Sapta is in seven, Bhangi, the sevenfold predication. 
as an illustration, consider this. Let's say that you say a chair exists. Okay. Well, the Jain doctrine of Sadhvat would say we can we can think of seven circumstances, seven propositions that we could make offer apropos of that chair. Okay. If there is a chair, you can say in some respects a chair, we'll call it object A, exists at a particular time or place. In proposition two, in some respects, it does not exist at a particular time or place. In some respects, it both exists and does not exist. Okay. So, you know, if you had to take, if you had to say A is B, you could say A is B, A is not B, A and B both are, right? You could, you could go in that, get that direction, right? The, what condition means that when you make a judgment, condition viewpoint, when you make a judgment, no proposition can ever be true in itself unless one sees the conditions under which it is limited. So in some respects, proposition three, A both exists and does not exist. In some respects, A is indescribable, where circumstances are indeterminate. In some respects, Proposition five, A exists and is indescribable. So this actually puts together propositions one and four. And then in some respects, A does not e exist and is indescribable, puts together propositions two and five. And then the seventh proposition, in some respects, A both exists and does not exist and is indescribable, puts together propositions four and six. Right? These are the seven possibilities. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what does this all add up to? So the, Jain, the Jains have a philosophy, which you find it in their texts. Uh, not all texts talk about it, because for example, manuals of conduct will not speak about it. You know, there are manuals which tell you, like those niyams, Chodha niyam, though that would be under a man, in a manual of conduct and then it would describe in substantial detail. This philosophy of Aneka, Anek Anantavad, Anek Anantavad, that is the theory of one-sidedness or the many-sidedness of reality. That is, it's a doctrine which says that reality, key, reality can be perceived from multiple points of view. No one point of view enables us to grasp the entire truth, though all of them taken together may help us to do so. You, you know, I, in English, people would say this is like pluralism. That's why I put there. But it's, it's, we'd have to be a little careful because pluralism use, is used in many different registers. And pluralism sometimes does mean that you allow for a plurality of thought. But pluralism and Anek Anandavad are not really the same. That's the English approximation. Now, before we get to this view, it is very clear that if the Jain text put this forward, and this seems to be the contribution of Mahavid himself, and I say that because, because the biographies of Parshwanath and Mahavir. And remember that Parshwanath, the 23rd Thakura, we do know a little bit about him. His biography suggests that the ideas of ahimsa, asetya, asetya is, is, is theft, not taking what one is not owns, aparigra is non-possession, right? These ideas were already present in Parshwanath. But Anek Anantavad does not seem to be associated with him at all. This seems to have been Mahavir's own contribution. And now Mahavir is almost certainly, a, or very likely, a contemporary of the Buddha. They were alive together. There was some overlap, and the Ajivikas were around. If the Jains put forward this view, they put it forward because 
it was clear that there were rival schools of thought at that time. This, therefore, this doctrine presupposes that. That is that they could only have come up with this if there were different points of view. And it seemed that each point of view had some merit to it, right? And before we consider the view, the, the philosophy, it's important to also suggest take account of the objection. If someone said, well, isn't that the case? I mean, when the Rig Veda, the hymn to creation that we saw, you know, that the hymn to creation says, well, you know, even God doesn't know how this world came around. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Isn't that, you know, maybe the world has been, maybe it hasn't. Isn't that already a line for the thought that there is there even in the Veda or generally speaking that we understand that there are many points of view? Of course, you can argue the opposite, right? From your own experience, that there are people who think that, well, they know the exact, the exact truth about a certain proposition. Right? But uh, I'm just simply saying that you have to anticipate this criticism, uh, because this criticism really is doesn't amount to much. Uh, to assert that contradictory predicates, contradictory meanings, saying different things about an identical subject, about that same subject, does not ipso facto, they, that is by itself mean that one is advocating for anek anantavad. Anek anantavad has to do with the proposition, the view, that when we try to apprehend reality, each apprehension may have some measure of truth, but by itself it is completely partial. And, and before I give you the parable that explains that, I think it is instructive to consider that I think only someone like the Mahavir or the Jains with their doctrine of nonviolence could have come up with the idea of anekanantavad. Why? Because what is the doctrine of nonviolence in actual practice? It means you you allow for a certain latitude of tolerance for others. Right? That's what it means, in, in, to put it in more colloquial terms. Now, it seems that it was carried over from everyday life, from everyday life, that everyone has a right to life, and, and every living thing has a right to life. It was carried over from there to the mental, to the realm of philosophy. That, that, you know, when we listen to the other, let's not immediately try to find what's different there, but let's also try to find what is similar there and what is true there. Right? And so what could be used to explain this doctrine of Anek Anandavad, the parable of the six blind men and the elephant? It's actually a, a, an Indian parable. It's an Indian parable. We don't know exactly where it started in India and when it started, but it's been around for a very long period of time. You find it in collections of tales, uh, all right? Um, and the parable is essentially this, that uh, the six, there were six blind men and they were told that an elephant was coming uh, and they were asked if each of them could describe an elephant. Now being blind, none, none of them had ever seen an elephant. So they, they're taken to the elephant. One of them touches the ear of the elephant and says, oh, I think the elephant is like a fan because it's like a hand fan, right? The other one touches the tail. And he says, I think the elephant is like a rope. The third one touches the body. He says, the elephant is like a wall. And so it goes. Each of them describes the elephant. And Anekanathavad says, each of them is partially right and each of them is partially wrong. Okay? Mm -hmm. Each of them is partially right because if you touch the, if you, touched only the ear, it looks like a fan, feels like a fan. And so on with each of the six parts that they touched. So the doctrine of Anek Anantavad 
is the many sidedness of reality that that reality it can see it can interpret mean that reality can be perceived from multiple point, points of view it's the view that you need all of these points of view to grasp the entire truth you need all of them sometimes right and this was i think my own view is that 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 Gandhi was deeply indebted to this, because that was Satyagraha was too, was Satyagraha was a way of seeking, right? You, soul force, truth force, Satya Agraha, truth force. You can't conf confront someone with truth because this is, and I left this out deliberately in my understanding the other day, the part I'm gonna tell you now, because I wanted to wait until we got to this. The word satyagraha, so it's satya plus agraha, but satya is, the etymological root is sat. Sat means being, being. So when I confront my opponent with satyagraha, I'm confronting them with the law of their own being. That's what I'm confronting them. I am making them aware of the law of their own existence. And no one can, so to speak, deny his or her own existence. No one will deny his or her own existence. So Gandhi's view was when Satyagra is offered in the correct spirit and you can make the other person understand it, they can never deny it because for them to deny it would be to deny their own very existence. Being means to exist, see, right? Now, I think that this idea was fundamentally born out of this notion of anek anantavat, the many-sidedness of reality that what you have to always do is you have to seek the truth and this may entail understanding the many-sidedness but as a political doctrine it may also entail things like compromise which some people started resisting they said oh he's compromising because for gandhi's point of view it was not compromise it was a supposition that the other side might seem completely erroneous but there's something there and i can't assume that my view represents the totality of truth hmm. all right so and i want to just end with one story now because i've told you about the importance of stories this is a mind-boggling story why were these stories told where are these stories from these are stories that were written down and they were written down, uh, composed and written down to be used to teach Jain people renunciation, the values of renunciation. This particular story that I'm telling you is from the Digambara, Brihat Katha Kosh, a text composed by Hari Sena in 931 CE. So over a thousand years ago, all right? That is, I think, um, quite extraordinary, the story. Uh, I'll give you the short form of it. So in the city of Mathura, remember Mathura has figured in, our, in my remarks today in North India, right? Because I mentioned that under the Kushans especially, it was a great giant center. So there was a, a courtesan there, uh, Kubera Sena, that was her name. And it's the text says that she's extraordinarily beautiful, all of that. Uh, she bears a she bears twins one day, uh, a son and a daughter. Uh, now this woman is a courtesan, the so she's living in a brothel, right? And the madam of the brothel, uh, and you know that brothel keepers don't like to have the women working there have any children. Right, because that interferes in their being able to have men coming in and, you know, dozens of them uh, every night. Uh, 
so she's been, she was trying to encourage Kuber, Kubera Sena to, to not have these children, but she went ahead and had them. She, 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 bears, she bears a son and a daughter, and then she, she gives them up for adoption because the madam of the brothel uh, is after her to abandon the children, all right? So she gives up these children for, for uh, what she does is she, she gives, gives uh, uh, the boy who is called Kubera Datta a ring, and she gives a similar ring for the girl called Kubera Datta as well but it would with the long a at the end she gives birth to these children and the 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 brothel owner the madam is is after her to give up these children because obviously having children will interfere in the ability of this woman to be able to do sexual work right prepares a ring for one of them and a ring for the other one a similar ring a finger ring and and she puts the rings on their fingers and then she puts them in a casket and the casket is floated down the river. We've heard similar stories uh, about other famous characters in history. Uh, she, these, this casket is, is floated in the river Yamuna, uh, where two merchants um, find this casket. You know, they, they've been going on the river, they see this casket, and they see these children. Um, uh, they open the casket and they see these two little babies, one, one a boy and one a girl. And remember, the boy and the girl are twins. They're, they're, they're siblings, right? Uh, so the two merchants, uh, each of them takes one child. And when these two children grow up, these two merchants are very close friends. And these two children, get, they get married. What you have is you have a brother and a sister who are marrying each other, right? And, uh, you know, at some point when they, when they see the rings, okay, um, it, and as I said, you know, I can't go over all the details, but, you know, somehow they had never been able to connect the fact that they were both related to each other. And of course, they couldn't be because they were growing up in two different households. But then when they get together at some point, then at some point, um, when they're married, they under, begin to understand that rings are very similar. Uh, they begin to understand that they, they are probably siblings. All right. So now, once they realize that they lose their taste for life because they've committed incest now. I mean, they may have married unknowingly, but, but they have married each other, right? They married each other. And uh, they lost all taste for worldly life, which they regarded as without value and as their enemy, filled with the desire for renunciation, the text says, etc. Now, in the meantime, Kubera Datta, uh, so Kubera Datta is the brother. Um, so he, uh, uh, he's a trader and he goes to Mathura. And when he goes to Mathura, he goes to the house of Kubera Sena, the courtesan, who, of course, he doesn't know is his biological mother. And he makes love to her. He makes love to her. Right? So he's making love to his own mother. And the, and the two of them together bear a son. Now th think think of all think of all what's happening, and so this is what the text says. Now one day the nun Kubera Datta, because remember that that you know he has married his sister, and his sister is now completely once she realizes, but she's also his wife. Once she realizes that the man I've married is actually my brother, she loses all taste for life. She wants she renounces everything. She becomes a nun, right? So one day the nun Kubera Datta saw the robust son of Kubera Datta. That is that she is now seeing the son of her husband, who's also her brother, <laughs> right? Okay, just, just think of all the relationships emerging here. And knowing how monks and nuns enlightened others, she spoke these absolutely true words. And I quote you, child, she says to him. Who is she saying this? She is saying this to someone who is what he is the 
he is actually her brother as well, but he's also the son, her son. Uh, sorry, he's uh, he, 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 uh, he is the stepson. Okay, and 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 all of this is going to be described. So she says, "Child, you are my brother-in-law, for you are the brother of my husband." Right, because they both they both have the same mother, Kubela Sena, the courtesan. And her mother is the same woman, and so you are also my brother. My husband begot you, and so that makes you also my child. But your father is the child of my rival in love, and that would make you my grandson. You are the brother of my mother's husband, which makes you my uncle. And you are my brother's child, which makes you my nephew. Your mother is my mother, who bore us both in her womb. And that woman is also the mother of my mother's lover, which makes her my grandmother. She is the wife of the young man who was born from my co-wife, which makes her also my daughter-in-law. And she is the mother of my husband, which makes her my mother-in-law as well. And it goes on. That's the story. Why? What is it doing? It is designed to produce disgust in you. It's designed to make you understand that this world is a hellish combination of all kinds of possibilities. Right? That's, this is a story included in a text. This text was a text which, like other texts, was meant to be an inspiration to seek renunciation, right? And so this is, how the, this is how the text ends. It ends actually didactically, that is, it tells you explicitly, even Kubera Sena saw how topsy-turvy the world of sense objects is, and she became disgusted with life in this world and took on herself the vows of the Jain householder. So she's a householder, now she takes on the vows, and she's going to now work towards the elimination of all of this karmic articles, right? This text was designed to help people embrace the idea of renunciation. And there are hundreds, thousands of stories. Uh, many Jain scholars have argued that Stories are the principal ways, not theological texts, but stories are the principal way in which people and the Jain faith are moved on, are, are inspired to understand their religion and, and then seek renunciation. Okay, so I think that that is it for, for this.